91-year-old Italian beaten and robbed by an illegal invader. This is what's coming to America. And we're back. On today's panel, we have our in-house mad bomber, Mike Sterling, our undercover CIA operative, Jeff MD, and one of Jeff's friends, Dan. Dan, I'll let you introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, Dan, 27 years of law enforcement in a uh, major city in the U.S. I recently had uh, the occasion to spend some time, three months, in fact, in Europe. I appreciate your service. Thank you. So, Mike, before we get into today's topic, I know you're dying to lay one on us here. Hit us with the uh, conflicted question of the day. Conflicted card of the day. <clears throat> All right, folks. You've been preparing for a complete collapse of modern civilization with three other families, sacrificing yourself financially to ensure the survival of your loved ones. You all have about a year's worth of supplies at a secured survival retreat. You were the last one to arrive at your location, and to your surprise, I don't know why this would be a surprise, two of the families broke protocol and brought with them extra friends and family members, enough to shave 40% off of your supply timeline. Your retreat is somewhat new and renewable food sources won't be ready before the food runs out. How would you handle the situation? And we're going to talk about this. We'll revisit this at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. That's a tough one. So let me quickly set the stage or as quickly as possible set the stage for today's discussion. We're going to be covering how what's unfolding in Europe, what's unfolded in Europe in recent years is a great predictor of what's fixing to happen here in the homeland. But we've seen another number of comments from the you know, keyboard warriors, whatever you want to call them, uh, questioning us, putting predictions out there. The plural of anecdote may not be data, but we've got a pretty good track record because we've got outstanding subject matter experts at our disposal. Suffice it to say, the SDN that we did on drone swarm technology, where one operator can control thousands of drones being used to attack open air venues, was validated a week after to the day when an RFP went out on SAM.gov asking for submissions on EMP weapons that were small and light, could be mounted on drones to take other drones down. So we're not using typical munitions, which would have collateral damage as well as the fact hopefully recover some data from those. I want to back up in time approximately 20 years. At that time, there was a bill introduced here in Florida that was called a racing bill. And the gist of it was, if you were driving down the road by yourself, beside somebody, below the speed limit, above the speed limit, didn't matter. If a law enforcement officer felt that you were racing, they would have been empowered to take your vehicle and your driver's license. There'd be no judicial oversight or due process at a maximum of four weeks was stipulated in the bill. And obviously that would be an infringement on our Fourth Amendment rights. But what it did do is it made me wonder where the heck this crap came from and discovered fairly quickly that the same law, almost word for word, was in effect in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada and had been in those other countries for a number of years. That's when I first discovered the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, the infiltration of Western governments and the pushing of their globalist agenda. And ever since then, it, it's been really easy to connect the dots. If you pay attention to what's going on in other Western countries, they're coming up with the recipe before they try to jam it down our throats here in America. So let's say you go back five years, look at the migrant invasion that was happening in Europe at that point in time. Lo and behold, we've now been facing the same crisis here in America. Today, when you look at the crime wave that has come along with this migrant invasion, very incompatible people. These are people who don't share our values or beliefs. They don't respect, respect our values or beliefs. Highly incompatible with Western society. And now you've got all hell breaking loose over there. I have a whole bunch of videos and text articles that I'm going to share. But before I do that, I'd like to go to you first, Jeff, and just get your opinion on using leveraging other countries to predict what, what's coming here, especially Europe. Sadly, I think Europe is ahead of us on this negative scale, so to speak. What we're seeing today with the, the protests from the pro-Hamas protesters across the United States is just several years behind what's been going on in Europe for quite some time. Uh, you have the Algerians in France who are rioting constantly. You've got the Pakistanis in Britain, the Eritreans in Britain were going at it with the cops using long staffs as weapons. And my first comment or first thought was, who in the hell are the Eritreans protesting against? 
but I think it may be the, you know, the Ethiopians or something. I don't know. But they've had it for a few years and we're starting to get it now in spades. And one of the things is not just the upheaval, but some of the policies. If you look at what's happened in Rhodesia, they, they basically drove out all their white farmers and they went from an ex, a food exporting company country to a food, food importing country and almost starved themselves to death. And what we're seeing now in, in Europe is you've got the Netherlands, the second largest food exporter in the world behind the United States. They're trying to close down thousands and thousands of farms under the under the rubric of, well, too much nitrogen. Of course, the atmosphere is 57% nitrogen, so good luck trying to keep that down. But we're seeing the exact same thing now happening in, in Germany. In fact, they had huge protests on Monday where the, the farmers shut down the scores of cities blocking the roads to protest uh, all the regulations that are trying to raise the price of diesel fuel. They're, you know, they're raising their taxes on them. And the new policies that they're trying to implement would cut 30% of their income. So, of course, they're upset. But what's that going to do to food production in Germany? So you're letting in millions of people from North Africa and Afghanistan and Syria. And at the same time, you're cutting your food production. And that's just going to drive prices up and make life harder for everyone. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Dan, as you mentioned, you've had occasion to be in uh, Europe for work and saw some of this stuff firsthand. Uh, could you share some of that with us? I uh, So I spent uh, time, I spent three months over there in uh, 15 different countries. Some you see it in more Others, not so much, depending on, on their government and their stance on immigration. Uh, I will say that uh, there are certain countries throughout Europe uh, where you do see uh, very high populations of uh, Eastern Africans, also uh, people from the Middle East. Obviously, I didn't have conversations with all these people, so I can't, I can, all I can do is kind of broad brush and what I observed. I will say that I spoke with uh, quite a few people that, uh, locals that I met, and I would always ask them safety questions, questions about crime, things to that in my law enforcement background. And uh, inevitably, they would all tell me that uh, illegal immigration uh, was their biggest problem. All but one city, they were, I'll get that later. Prague is, Prague was relatively, a relatively safe city. Uh, they actually complained about English bachelor parties. That was their big complaint. Okay. Partying too much and fighting in the streets, believe it or not. That was <laughs> a number of people had voiced that uh, that, to, that to me. But inevitably, uh, all the locals uh, that I spoke with inevitably said that you know, illegal immigration, I guess you could say uh, illegal claims of asylum with Western Africans and also a, a big portion uh, from Nigeria also uh, were the driving forces of crime. It wasn't just one person that told me this, it was several. I, I don't. I didn't ask any proof or any stats or anything like that. It was all just kind of uh, personal experiences, what they observe, what they, what they read in their local papers, what they see in their streets or on their local news. But that was a theme across most cities in Europe, not all, but most of the cities that uh, that I was in. Hey, Dan, did you happen to hear of any of these incidents happen and then they were either being suppressed or twisted by the media? So the, there was a couple of locals I had uh, spoke with that did say media does suppress it, doesn't report on it. I was in Paris, France for their riots, their last round of riots. I know it seems like they're always rioting yeah. over there. It was uh, last late spring, early summer when they were uh, writing about their uh, the retirement age, increase in retirement age. Uh, I did not see where I was staying. I did not actually see uh, the writing, but it did get extremely violent. And I don't know, I wasn't here, so I don't know how much was covered here, uh, but it got extremely violent. And I think your, uh, your analogy of using what's going on in, in Europe to predict what's going on here is good uh, because from what I can see from what news coverage Paris was, their local news channels were showing. Much like in the U.S., when there's one protest, within that protest, there's 50 different factions of people protesting 50 different things. Everybody, every group wanting to outdo the next. Uh, I do have personal experiences with uh, mass protest situations and rioting in the U.S., uh, my, my previous employer, and it is that way. And it gets somewhat chaotic. Obviously, before my time, I don't know, it was like in the 60s, if uh, the the protesters slash rioters were more unified in their cause, I can't speak to that because I wasn't wasn't alive. But I can tell you that seeing that in Europe and then seeing it here, I think 
I think that is a good predictor. So before we move to Mike, I just want to ask you a quick question. Uh, we have a friend, Keith Graves, uh, ChristianWarriorTraining.com, uh, former Bay Area SWAT team leader and trainer, <clears throat> excuse me, trains law enforcement to this day. And he only retired a few years ago and he said he he moved back to America. In other words, he moved from the Bay Area around San Francisco to Idaho. So he considers that a, a foreign country. But he was uh, you know, on the street with squads during all the crazy stuff that was going on in 2020 in 2016 during the election years, he said that one of the questions they asked as part of their protocol, in addition to asking these protesters that they were arresting to provide identification was, what do you do for work? And he said they didn't even hesitate. They said, I'm a paid professional protester. Did you ever run across that? 100%. That's a thousand percent true. Uh, what we were seeing, my former employer was uh, people from all over the country were coming in and were protesting. Uh, nobody personally told me this, but I had spoken with other officers who during their interviews, their custodial interviews, post-arrest, uh, arrestees admitted that they had been paid, got on a bus, were shipped to Chicago and or other cities to be paid protesters. So yes, that is a real thing. It happens all the time, all over the country. People can deny it, but it's a thousand percent true. Yeah, appreciate that insight. Not that we ever doubted what Keith had to say or what we've read, but it's good to hear from somebody who's been on the front lines. Uh, Mike, give me your take on using other Western countries as a predictor for what's coming to America. So back in 2017, of course, I'm I'm still wrapped into into several technical intelligence networks uh, just because of my my EOD company. Um, we we maintain one of the largest uh, munitions and explosives libraries outside of of uh, outside of government hands. And there's a lot of there's a lot of the collector world that will talk to us. So a lot of a lot of the government technical intelligence people use us as an intermediary with the, with the mm. collector world and back in 2017 i learned something very interesting uh, through through my my european government contract uh or contacts there was a huge quantity of riots in the low countries both in in belgium and holland over there for the muslim communities during that time and it, it was completely unaware of it here in the u.s and i definitely learned that if the eu does anything very very well they suppress the press very very well and uh we're talking about huge street battles over there in rotterdam alone the uh the uh, interpol sees two entire freighters loaded with arms and I, they were going through the guys were going through pulling out all kinds of crazy from all over the world a bunch of it iranian as well uh but yeah we were uh, that that was of course it all it all tied back to the gray arms programs wow i'll tell you what you didn't see anything about it and we're talking about some of the some of the pictures and some of the stories that i was getting out of out of my guys in in belgium were amazing where they were talking about outright over street battles hundreds of people on on both sides they actually wound up the both both holland and belgium wound up having to bring in their armies to supplant their their uh, law enforcement because the law enforcement guys were outgunned not by a little bit either so absolutely being able to being able to look at what's going on there versus what is is coming here you have to look at the 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 european populace is a lot more is a lot more compliant than the american populace is uh, across the board I mean, they've just let's face it they've been under they've been under under kings and regimes and whatever strong man going all the way back to tribal times they're a lot easier to govern than americans is let's face it they were right in the movie stripes john winger said it man our forefathers were kicked out of every decent nation on earth we are the wretched refuse we're the ones that you can't uh, us and the australians we're the ones that you can't govern very well so they got to try it out elsewhere before they can try it out here my suspicion is that that was the case in australia because it was a penal colony for Great Britain or the UK. Well, so was so were the Southern United States. Right. Carolinas and Georgia the Carolina and Georgia penal colony. This episode of SDN is brought to you by Switch It Up, your national grid down service provider. Get a quote on a solar PV system with battery backup at switchitupinc.com or click the link in the video description below. I was going to say, you had talked about the WEF, WEF earlier in Klaus Schwab, and I don't think most people realize his history. And I looked it up because I'm like, who in the hell is this guy? That dude he, is straight he, Dr. Evil, isn't he? 
He he really is, and he is. Uh, he's never had a real job. He he was a college professor. Then he started the WEF and lives off of all the donations to that. <clears throat> But his real interesting history is where he got his money to start with. He inherited it from his dad. And who was his dad? He was a German Swiss industrialist who made munitions for the Nazis Mm -hmm. in World War II. But because he was Swiss, when Nazi Germany collapsed, he ran off to Switzerland and avoided any kind of repercussions for the fact that he was running entire industry sectors. And that's the money that Schwab used to start the WEF. The, and I always just say the apple didn't fall far from the tree. And people don't Illinois believe me Nazis. as I go to Wikipedia. It is in even a liberal site like Wikipedia. They have it in there and it's right. And they have his dad's name and where he worked and everything. Just to add some context, it, Klaus Schwab and the WEF started their Young Global Leaders Program in the 1990s. And they've used that to indoctrinate politicians around the world to toe the line on some of these crazy globalist initiatives. And good examples would be people like Dan Crenshaw. Dan Crenshaw is, is like a modern day John McCain on steroids. He's He's got a very spotty record. Thankful for his service to our country, but he's a WEF pawn, as are literally hundreds of other politicians just seen all den or all dern the former pm of new zealand she was one who absolute power corrupts absolutely justin trudeau uh, macron in france these are all wef young global leader graduates who are enacting basically Klaus Schwab's orders, the WEF's orders to to push us one step closer to a one world government. And the reason that I've said for years that America is the firewall between globalism and freedom, because we're the only country left who has the ability to defend ourselves as individuals. So everybody else that's been stripped. There was a comment made, Mike, I'm not sure if you caught it in a video, one of our SDNs last week, where you and I have frequently mentioned on air that we're witnessing this epic struggle between those of us who just want to be left alone, and those other people who just can't leave other people alone and, and see fit to try and impose their ideology on us. This crazy Obama ideology, the woke virus, whatever you want to call it. There was a comment on one of our videos where the person said in every instance in history when something like this has unfolded, if the group who just wanted to be left alone took no action, the other group basically ran them over with a steamroller. When you said that Europeans on the whole are generally more uh, complacent or more compliant, compliant uh, that really, that's what jog my memory on this particular comment. We still have this problem, right? So I don't want to name names, but one of our... Uh, partners that we work with, vendors that we work with, has a national level business. When he first started doing business with Survival Dispatch, he said to me, oh my God, this is the first time in my entire life I've actually been able to discuss my viewpoint without being labeled a crackpot. <laughs> so, And no, nothing he had to say was really crazy. It's it's the topics we discuss on a regular basis. I'm, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to really quickly whip through 20 tabs in web browser. I'm going to put all the links down below so people can go check them out themselves. But I'm going to play the very first video, which is some migrants in Europe stating exactly what their plans are and what they're going to do in Europe. So let me get this shared here. I got so many tabs open. I'm going to find it here first. Bear with me. Come on now, find it. Struggle is real. All right. So you should be able to see that now. So give me a second here. That's a great look. If the audio is not loud enough coming through zoom with this i'll I'll splice this video in the rest of them though we're just going to discuss but this this gentleman here and his uh supporters who are with him straight up say what their plans are boom boom you're dead so This footage was a boat that had come across from Libya, I believe. And there's other footage of that voyage where before they got into the port in Italy, they tore up their IDs and threw them in the trash so that uh, there was no way to trace who they actually were and claim their refugee status, asylum, whatever it may be called. So some quick stuff here. Again, I'll put the links down below. We're not going to fixate on these too, too much. But here's a video video here that we couldn't play even if we wanted to this migrant is is trying to steal stuff from a child in ireland 
And when the child doesn't succumb to him, uh, he whips his equipment out and starts masturbating in public in front of everybody. This is, I think they refer to this, the, the left refers to this as a cultural enrichment, I believe. And next one here shows Paris. So it's kind of interesting that you were there recently, Dan. I'll play just a section of this. Tell me if this resembles anything that you heard of or that you saw, which was once a beautiful city not that many years ago. So even in just a quick couple seconds there, you can see it doesn't look like any indigenous French people to me. It, did you see anything to that effect by chance, Dan? Uh, as a matter of fact, I did. And like I said before, Paris was probably the worst, or I should say the best example of what you're speaking of. I had some downtime and I walked to the uh, Eiffel Tower one night. I don't know, it was probably 9.30 at night and... That's exactly what I experienced at the Eiffel Tower. Uh, some people, a lot of street vendors, mostly of what appeared to be, uh, Im Im I, I can't speak to their status, but uh, immigrants from Africa. Okay. I, I knew they were that. And a lot of people uh, Middle Eastern, of Middle Eastern descent. And at the risk of sounding uh, politically incorrect, it didn't feel like a safe environment. And I made the comment to the gentleman I was walking with that it didn't feel safe. And if anybody's ever spent time in large groups, because it was a large group of people, there's a lot of people milling around, hanging around, some apparently for no reason other than maybe looking for maybe an opportunity. There were some that were selling things, very pushy street vendors. But anybody who's ever spent time in a large group environment like that on the street uh, can speak to that there is a sense that you get in your head that it's your, your brain telling you this may not be a safe environment. And it's not something that you just pull out of the air Life experience tells you these things, and the more life experience you have, and the more times that you've spent in, in maybe somewhat dangerous situations, you can kind of feel that uh, environment. So we didn't stick around there long. We went and walked someplace else, and uh, we actually stopped at uh, a little corner store to get some water. And uh, there were some uh, some gentlemen, all, all group of gentlemen of Middle Eastern descent, hanging around outside this store. Now we're talking probably 10 o'clock at night, maybe 10, 15 at night. Walked out. They started saying something in uh, their native tongue. I didn't speak it because I, I couldn't tell you what it was but i can tell by their mannerisms and their body language that it wasn't uh they weren't so uh, nothing happened nothing transpired but i i totally agree that is what paris i was shocked because it was my first time in paris growing up you hear all these wonderful stories about paris and then to go there and see what it was it was kind of uh disappointing but i'm sure there are people that would argue with me on this point and say it's still the most beautiful city in the world but and i spoke with locals there who told me what their concerns were their safety concerns, uh, their concerns about crime. And like I said before, inevitably, illegal immigration was, mo I wouldn't say everybody's main concern, but a handful of people I spoke with to find out where and what was a good area to go, to not go, safety reasons. Like I said, my law enforcement background, uh, inevitably, the majority of them said illegal immigration was their main concern. And obviously, as anybody who's got uh, has their eyes open knows that that's been an issue, not only in Europe, but especially in Paris recent years. So <clears throat> there's a gentleman by the name of Tony Blauer. He's a good friend of ours. He's widely recognized as the preeminent authority on contending with sudden violence. So he trains DOD, law enforcement, private individuals, everything in between. And he frequently mentions that every single person that he has coached and this is not like martial arts training. This is situational awareness, how to avoid a confrontation, how to de-escalate a confrontation, those sort of things. Every single person who got into or was a victim of sudden violence had a gut feeling that said, there's something wrong. I'm not safe. And it, it's some sort of intuition that is real. We all have it. So it's interesting that you would mention that. I'm going to try to whip through some of these other tabs as quick as I can. Actually, before then, Mike, Jeff, quick question for you, since you both served overseas in the Middle East. Do you remember Gaddafi saying, y'all don't want to take me out because if you do, there's going to be a mass. I'm the only thing stopping the mass invasion of Europe by people coming from Africa. Do you have any comments or perspective on that? Oh, I remember that. And he, he, he was kind of right. You know, people complain, oh, we got to, or we're happy to get rid of Gaddafi. And sometimes a bastard just is better than the bastard you don't know. Look what happened in Iraq when, um, I can't remember the guy's name who was in charge of everything for us, decided to dissolve the Iraqi National Army. And that was the dumbest thing. And in, in, I was in I was in CIA at the time, and we were just saying, oh my God, what the hell does he think he's doing? But even after World War II, we kept the Wehrmacht intact because the last thing you want are hundreds of thousands of well-armed 
trained soldiers with no ability to, to survive or to support their families. So they just become gangs. And that's exactly what happened in Iraq. You put a quarter of a million guys with access to AK-47s out on the street with no money and no job. But I'll be right. So my brother-in-law was a Navy intel and he ran the desk for Bayron for 12 years. And obviously <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff he can't share because it's top secret. But at a very high level, what he told us was that his job was to track the most dangerous weapons that were in the country of Bayron and make sure that the least evil of all the bad guys was who had them in their possession. So interesting perspective. Sometimes the devil is better than the devil you don't, right? Next one here. This is something that recently happened in the UK where there's multiple Muslims doing prayers in the streets and a lady was a Christian praying and she got arrested and they didn't. And it's just an example of inconsistent application of the law favoring. Uh, I don't, you, I, you want to talk politically incorrect, Dan? I call them invaders. I don't call them migrants or immigrants. Here's uh, I th something we briefly touched on earlier. So there have been these stabbings in Ireland, more than one. Actually, there's been stabbings across the UK, but these are children being stabbed by migrants. I think Algeria uh, was the one where there was four or five of them stabbed. And as soon as the parents and the native Irish people spoke out against the mainstream media, uh, lambasted them as being right wing, whatever you want to call it, right wing crazy people. Yeah, that is it, really coming back to bite the Irish government right now. They are about that close to another 1971. It, it's interesting you mention that, Mike, because right after that stabbing where I think it was five children were stabbed, there were some hotels that were being renovated that were going to be used to house migrants, and the Irish went and burned them all to the ground before they could be occupied. So, yeah, I, and, On your list of people on this planet that you really want to have pissed off at you they're, they're pretty low on my list i've seen what they can do i don't, right. I don't want them angry with me and then and these people just man i'm they have no concept of what they've done so once we get through the balance of these tabs i'll just give you a, a chance to mull these over i'd like to hear from everybody what can we learn from the europeans as far as their problems with migration and what initiatives do you think we should undertake in america at the federal state and local level but let me whip through the rest of these tabs and that'll give you all a minute to kind of mull those questions over so Here's another one in Ireland. Uh, this was a very recent uh, riot. They damaged all kinds of stuff. And we're, we've got these peaceful protests going on. Excuse me here as well. Here you go, Dan. France. There have been multiple Catholic churches converted to, I forgot the word now for uh, the Muslim places. Mosque. 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 Sorry. I don't have Alzheimer's, but I got some timers. Sometimes I remember, sometimes I forget. This is actually a really big number of churches that have been converted. This is in the Holy Trinity being used for Islamic prayer as opposed to Catholicism. I Here's another one that links to a, a recent riot in England. And when you go watch this video, and again, the link will be below, it, it's actually, it's it's more chaotic than any riots we've had so far in the past year as far as the pro-Hamas demonstrators are concerned. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. This is a, this is a migrant who was fixated on a female who was married and he climbs up the side of this building and stabs the girl and her boyfriend or her husband. It, it's pretty crazy. This one's not recent. This is a couple years old. I'll stop there. I can't play all this stuff on YouTube. It will get slapped down hard. This one just happened in the past week. That's a pregnant lady in France and this invader grabs her and throws her to the ground. I'll play this one because it's very, very short. Uh, that's that's the type of crime that uh, you alluded to, Dan. Now, here's the craziest one of them all. John Fetterman. I don't believe for a minute that he won the election in Pennsylvania because there was so much cheating going on. Has a stroke, wins the election, is more of a potato head than Joe Biden, goes for treatment and comes back out and he's turned into a conservative. The Democrats are they're, they're pissed at him because... He's speaking out against everything. And this video is especially worth watching because if you recall, Fetterman couldn't string three words together, much like Joe Biden. Now, all of a sudden, he's had whatever treatment he had and he's articulate and he's he's on the right side of the history now. I find it pretty ironic. Next one here. This just happened in the past week. It's a very short clip. I'll play it. 91-year-old Italian beaten and robbed in broad daylight. 
by one of these invaders. It, and I'm going to stop it there because it gets pretty violent after that. And I, I, again, we don't want to anger the uh, YouTube overlords. Although I will say that we've struck a deal with Clout Hub, C L O U T H U B, to get our videos over there. We won't be censored like we currently are. This one here, I can't show. I can't play it at all. And I had to stop it at this particular location. So these people in their apartment look outside, and here's a migrant with his pants down masturbating in their front entranceway. So they poured that water on them to get them to go away. And again, as it says in the, the comment above that, this is this is the cultural enrichment that they're undertaking so that's not flash dance from a different perspective i no comment so dan this is uh, i don't know if you recognize the name I'm, I'm not fluent in french but this video shows a section of downtown paris in between their freeways and it, it looks like a landfill looks like a complete dump there's just trash everywhere kind of looks like a democrat run city kind of looks like san francisco before xi jinping came for his visit with uh, with biden uh this next one here so back to ireland just for you mike this is a pamphlet that's been handed out that is telling women and children don't go out at nighttime it's not safe in, in their own country and there's multiple instances of these types of flyers being handed out uh, this one here is a story in France, where a little girl was, uh, she was used in some sort of ceremony where she was sacrificed, raped, and tortured by the invaders. 65,000 kids missing, reportedly missing in France right now, and probably pipeline straight to Jeffrey Epstein's island. Uh, this video here is, is much like the one that I played earlier from Paris, although this is Sweden. It just shows it, it's a complete mess. It looks like a third world part uh, country. Import the third world, become the third world. There are countless videos out there of this situation where multiple invaders attack young white kids or indigenous kids and, and beat the shit out of them and steal their goods. I saw one on New Year's Day. Three of them swarmed a young lad just because they wanted to steal his jacket. Here they wanted to steal this kid's bicycle. And uh, next one here, th these are gang wars that are going on in the UK. So it's what you mentioned, Jeff, these rival factions from different countries rioting against each other. And it's not like a riot or that we had, say, the BLM riots. The these are diametrically opposed groups. So it it's not like they're in sync cooperating with, with each other like Antifa and BLM did. Let me just get over to the next tab here. Uh, this one here, I don't know if you guys caught this. This, this is about 10 days old. Uh, I think this was in Birmingham. And a group of migrants went after the cops with sticks and weapons. And, well, it says and, London. And beat the shit out of a bunch of cops. I, if memory serves me right, it was either 30 or 40 law enforcement officers <clears throat> were hospitalized as a result of this. So a, a prime example of not respecting our values here. And I I think we're just about at the end. I've got one more. This venue here in Manchester was the site of a terrorist attack. Uh, it says in here six years ago. This was over the Christmas holidays that it was used by the invaders to preach uh, launching jihadi against the uh, citizens of the UK, Britain in particular here. So it, it, the irony is, is brutal, right? This is the site of a terrorist attack six years ago but now it's being used as a venue to promote this jihadi and i should have probably bought, brought the video up of what happened at the exact same time in new york city when these pro hamas demonstrators took over the ground floor of the world trade center about 10 days ago that's just disgusting if you ask me they killed several thousand of our people and then they're going to go and take it over unbelievable back to the questions what can we learn from europe's problems with migration and what initiatives do you think we should undertake in America at the national, state, and local levels? From here on in, it's wide open. I don't have anything else to put up on the screen. Who wants to go first? Well, uh, I'll say on the national level, obviously, you got to close the border. We're not going to get that while Biden's in office. We've got to make equal application of the law. It's it's that easy. If you're going to throw a J6er in prison for seven years for trespassing, you need to be able, you need to prosecute these pro Hamas. The protesters who are blocking traffic, disrupting things, destroying stuff, defacing the national cemeteries and national monuments, start putting these assholes in jail. And it will stop because people don't like going to jail. 
But right now, they know no one's going to do a thing to them. And then when they scream bloody murder, like care gets out there and says, oh, you're only doing this to us because we're Muslim. And we're saying, no, we're only doing this to us because you're breaking the damn law. And as long as you break the law, you're going to go to jail. And we got to get rid of these stupid Soros prosecutors and hey, get someone who believes that, hey, you break the law, you're going to get punished for it. Reinforcement works. On that topic, Jeff, I think that the left constant and the woke constantly say anything that our side disagrees with, they immediately throw it out there. You're racist. Well, that's not racist. No, well, that's application of the law. So it, it should apply equally. I totally agree. Mike, what you got to say on this? <laughs> I'll just own it. Go ahead. It's fine. Yeah, but you're yeah. from Alabama. So that's, they, <laughs> they might kick you out of the state if you weren't. And, and oh, just, just come hold on, on a second. Now. Come on. Hold on now, a second. Now. We're not Mississippi, not Mississippi. Hey, l- listen, for all you assholes out there who do not understand being sarcastic and facetious, those were sarcastic, facetious comments on Mike's part and my part. They were not to be taken literally because there's always one of you lunatics in the in the comment section who takes something that's sarcastic and try to make it like something terrible has been done to you because it was a literal statement. It was not literal. It was facetious. Carry on, Mike. I, I think one of the I, I think one of the big things that that on our side is a problem and has been a problem. And it's it's just it's part of, of our makeup is we are the part of the world who wants to just be left alone to do our thing. Unfortunately, a 100 percent defensive strategy never works. Eventually, you're going to get war down. Right. Well, there was something that was brought up. Uh, I was watching. Uh, I was. I was watching the guys from Forward Observer, and Mike Shelby brought this up, and and I think it. I think it has bearing here, and it's a. It's a a line from a movie back in 1999 called Ride with the Devil. It's about. It's about bleeding Kansas, and and the the big problems with Missouri and Kansas and stuff right before the the kickoff to the Civil War, and th- this quote comes out, and I I think it has strong bearing here. As I saw these northerners build that town, I witnessed the seeds of our own destruction being sown. It was the schoolhouse. Before they built their church, even they built uh, even before they built that church they built a schoolhouse and they let in every tailor's son and every farmer's daughter in that county they rounded up every pup into that schoolhouse because they fancied that everyone should think and talk the same free thinking way they do with no regard to station custom propriety and that is why they will win because they believe everyone should live and think just like them and we shall lose because we don't care one way or another how they live we just worry about ourselves and want to be left alone that's right right on the money and it's very profound so the 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 point to this whole thing is is i I hate it but we can't be we want to be left alone i don't i don't want to have anything to do with this kind of stuff i want to i've 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 spent enough time running around in other people's countries seeing the the terrors and 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 just the awfulness that is war in the aftermath of war i clean up after a lot of wars man and it sucks but in this case for our own country we've got to be we've got to be out front you've got to work you've got to work with your own local politics you've got to start it down at the grassroots level you gotta you gotta put proper people into into mayoral and and legislators and and judges and everything like that you've, you've got school to work boards. on this kind of stuff school boards oh my god yes so we have the only we have the only k through 12 daughters of the american revolution school here in in my county and probably so so a large quantity of our of our year entertainment is sec football right roll tide when it's not that our primary entertainment here in Marshall County is watching is watching the Daughters of the American Revolution and the state school board in Montgomery go at it. And that is hilarious. The state school board, they'll have this huge liberal discussion and, and everything like that and come up with just these huge speeches and everything and watch one of these sweet little ladies stand up in her white gloves and look them dead in the eye with that very stern grandmother look and go, no. And then just sit down. <laughs> and it's a riot to watch. That's what I'm talking about right there. You got to stand up to him and you got to say no. And at a certain point, enough is enough. We are not the compliant European people, right? We're not going to sit here. We're not going to put up with this, all this kind of stuff. We're going to go ahead and move forward. Now, how does that look? All right. At a certain point, we're going to have to say racist or not. I don't care. All right. I'm an American. Most of these people are Americans. If we're going to sacrifice, if we're going to salvage our nation in some form and some form of our freedoms, uh, it's going to have to look like 1919. 
It's going to have to look like 1946, and it's going to have to look like 1955 again. We are going to have to have another mass deportation, which is something, like I just said, we've had three of those at the end of the First World War, end of the Second World War, and the end of the Korean War. We held mass deportations here in the United States in order to make jobs available again. But we've been getting in the way, we've been tripping on our own feet because of all of these liberal ideas. You're going to have to boot 10 million people out of this country. You're going to have to round them up and you're going to have to boot them out. Is that happy? No. Does it look pretty? No. Is it going to is it going to have the gnashing of teeth and a lot of people going to get angry about that? Yep. I agree. But not only have we done it before, everybody's done it before. And but what people seem to what amazes me how people especially people on the left, of course, come up and say, these people have a right to be here. No, I know. no, they don't. Think of it as having a party in your house. And if somebody doesn't leave, what do you do? You kick their ass out. You say, okay, closing time, last call, <clears throat> everybody leave, but they don't just get to stay. You kick them out. And I'm for immigration. I'm for legal immigration. And I'm for immigration of, you look at people and screen them and say, does this, some, does this person bring something to the party? Is this an, an Indian PhD uh, computer science guy who wants to start a, a new software company? Great. Start it here. Contribute to our society. But if you get some guy who comes up, what do you do? Well, I don't do anything. I've been just sitting on the side of the road for the last six months. And we're getting a lot of fighting age males coming in. And there's not a lot of females coming in. It's mostly just single men. And that's going to put a strain like China has. They have an excess of young men because they aborted all their girls. Mm hmm and that causes problems on frustration. You see it in the Arab world as well, because not to be gross about it, guys aren't getting laid. They get frustrated. And when they get frustrated, they fight. And, well, and, we're and that goes fighting back, that problem here. And that goes back to historical precedent. If you look at the if you look at the um the, the problems that England had with the Norman coast. For a, every generation, there would be a glut of young men with no available wives what happens every single time same with the normans same with a same with the burgundians same with a same same with all the uh all the all the all the scandinavian Historically, every time you have more females than men first more females are born than men slightly more females than men than males but then you have females died in childbirth so they they kind of got cold and men died in war as human health improved and wars continued you actually had a glut of females. Now, you can say what you want. You could have polygamy. You could have all sorts of stuff. You get safety and helmets. Can, and a guy can father children when he's 60. So he, his wife could pass and he'd get married again and have five more kids. But when you, but now we're to the point where we have a glut of men, at least here, because they're not because we're raising them or that we're rearing a glut of men. It's we're letting them in. And in China, they did it because they had sex selection abortions. And now they've got like 20 million more men than women in, in the youth. And that's going to be a huge problem. When you mess with nature and their demographics, it's going to bite you. Good insight, Jeff. Uh, Dan, before we get your perspective, I just want to mention one thing. The uh, GAO, General Accounting Office, recently released a report stating that the cost of these illegal invaders is somewhere in the range of $451 billion a year to the taxpayer. And that depending on whose numbers you want to believe, somewhere between $5 billion and $15 billion could have completely secured the southern border with the wall, plus all sorts of other technologies. So we're spending an order of magnitude more money to facilitate these people who are, they get their free phone, they get their... Uh, just like Mark Lamb showed, they get their prepaid visa card with five to ten thousand dollars on it. They become well. Here's a great example. And Mike, being a vet, tell me this doesn't piss you off. One hundred and sixty thousand doctor's appointments for veterans at the VA last year were canceled so that the VA doctors could tend to illegal invaders. That's horseshit. No matter how you cut it. So. I want to get back on track with Dan. Dan, so the question is, uh, what lessons can we learn from Europe's problems with migration? What initiatives do you think we should undertake in America, state, national, local levels? Uh, to, well, to echo Jeff's comments, I too am pro-legal immigration. I think probably all of us on this panel can mm -hmm. uh, say that we know people that immigrated to this country legally, prospered, and have added to the benefit of this country. Mm -hmm. personal, I have personal friends that I grew up with that 
that have done such. One thing I can I can speak to at the local level, which at mo- most major American don't allow their law enforcement. No, most, not all. I don't want to get caught painted into a corner. Don't allow their law enforcement to uh, ask any questions pertaining to any immigration status upon arrest. And there's other cities that, let's say that you grab somebody for a crime, you arrest them, you run their name, their name pops with uh, some sort of a immigration warrant. There are some cities in this country that won't even allow you to contact the federal authorities to come grab this guy, to have him deported out of the country. Now, what does that tell you when your city is not allowing you to work with other law enforcement agencies to get a criminal who's now, there's a, there's a warrant, who's got, you can be legally arrested at the federal level. And they won't let you work with these other federal authorities to have this person either tried for other crimes, if it's a criminal offense or if it's an immigration offense, to have them um uh, exported out of the country. Now, me being ever the pessimist, and as most law enforcement officers are, I think it's too late. I think that if you break a pipe in your house, right, and your house is flooded, you can stop the water from coming in, shut the pipe off, but your house is still flooded. I think that we've reached the pa- we've passed the point of no return. And I hate to, to sound like a pessimist, but unless, as Mike was speaking on, there's mass deportations, which I don't personally see our country. I don't, I don't see that happening. And I hope that I'm wrong, but I just, I think that if you did mass deportations, I think there'd be, there'd be riots in the street. Mm. I think that there would be multiple, multiple attacks on law enforcement. You'd have murder of law enforcement all over the country trying to enforce these, whether it's at the state, local, or national level. I don't agree with it, but I, I hate to be the pessimist. I just, and I don't know, maybe you guys have a better perspective than I, but I just, I can't see a mass deportation in our future. Do I think that needs to be done? Yes. If somebody's here illegally, they've broken, they've broken a law. So all you need to do is enforce the federal laws that are on the books, which we've heard everybody say a million times, but it's just, it's not being done. Not under this this administration. There's so much bureaucracy at the federal level. Jeff can attest to that, that it's hard to get everybody on board to to uh, to enforce these laws. But even if we just put forth a stance that we were not going to accept illegal immigration, maybe it would stem the flow from all these South American countries. One last thing is I recently spent some time in the Bogota, Bogota International Airport. And I had some time to kill while I was waiting for my flight. And I was standing there and I noticed there was probably 75 to 100, uh, almost all male, I don't want to call them immigrants, I don't know what their status was in the airport, but they were all of African descent. That I can assure you, I could, because I, I heard them speaking in their native tongue. So I was sitting there, and I wanted to see which flight this group got onto. There was about four or five women with them, but the rest was they were all men, and they got on a flight to Miami. Watched it with my own eyes. So, so maybe they're going on vacation, but there is something definitely going on, and it's it's scary, and it is gonna it's gonna come back and bite us in the ass. And so you're nice. seeing it. Some major cities, it's good. Well, it's biting us in the ass currently from a financial standpoint, as you pointed out, uh, but also from a criminal standpoint. I know that there are cities in this in the country that are now uh, the illegal immigrants are clashing with local gangs over sale of drugs. I know that firsthand. Yeah, so absolutely. it is happening. And so couple, these aren't Boy Scouts that are coming to this country. 100%. Just a couple quick comments to the points you raised, Dan. Number one, that even the DHS and Mayorkas have confirmed that there have been people caught at the southern border from 160 different countries, number one. Number two, there are, for lack of a better term, travel agencies in Africa that have several different levels of packages, depending on how much money the person has, that will get them to our southern border. And who knows, could be the people who funded the people you saw in Bogota. Hard to say, but they've got websites. I've gone and read them. Or this much money. This is the economy package. You're going to be on the boat and you're going to have to walk a whole bunch all the way to the top of the line. Here's your plane ticket that will take you to very close to the American border. And then we'll take a bus and we'll get you the rest of the way. I can tell you that I can tell you that this group was not hurting for money from the clothes they were wearing to uh, they all had cell phones. And that it was evident. Uh, I I found it very odd that this large, this many people were all going to Miami. They were all huddled together. It was obvious that they were all a single group. It wasn't just coincidence. It, it was it was evident that this was a single group and they were all traveling together. And I thought it was odd to see that many people traveling to one location within the U.S. and obviously stopping in Bogota first. I saw another group also about the same size, all men except for maybe two or three women. They were, I watched them get on a plane to San Salvador, all of African descent. So I don't know. I can't, I didn't have a conversation with any one of them. So I can't say what they're, they're driving, uh, 
force was, but it stood out to me. It, as soon as I walked past it, it, it jumped out at me. I've heard it described actually, Dan, as a, as a cottage industry in Africa. I believe it. With these good, better, best packages to get you into America, the southern border. I, I can't remember what it was that you said, Mike, exactly, but I, I made a note. I think it was on the mass deportations, maybe, and Dan also saying the other side wouldn't accept it. I think from an election standpoint, we're now past the point of no return, as Dan said, that if the Democrats win, everybody else that doesn't want to accept it won't accept it. And if Trump gets back in, then those people aren't going to accept him as a legitimate president. I don't know how you fix that. But the only thing I've got to add, great suggestions on everybody's part. I got, I got two things. Number one, non-citizens should not be counted towards electoral college votes and the distribution of seats for the House of Representatives in the census. And if the last number that I saw was that if you took all the illegal invaders out of the equation, that blue states would lose somewhere, I believe it was 28 seats in the House of Representatives. So they those seats would have be transferred to other jurisdictions that have a higher concentration of actual citizens as part of their populace. So getting rid of uh, non-citizens counting towards electoral college votes and House of Republicans or House of uh, Congress seats would be a big thing. And the thing that just stands out to me with this current situation that we've had since the election in 2020 was clearly stolen. The only way we're going to fix this shit is you got to have voter ID. It's a paper ballot, same day results, and no mail-in votes for anybody unless they're in our armed forces and they're serving overseas, and no machine counting, full stop. If Argentina, which is supposedly kind of on the line between second, third world country, can count 40 million votes in the same night for their election, which was a month or so ago, we're supposed to be the most advanced country in the world. We can't do it. We did it for years. Why well, can't we do it now? Look at India. India, it's 1.2 billion people. Right. They know who their president is that night. Yeah. And given the high level of literacy in the country, they're not using computers to do that. This is a hand count it's in little villages spread across the whole subcontinent. Yeah, they exactly. can do it, but we cannot. That's embarrassing. Well, I, I believe that we can. It's just that we have these bad guys in the way. I honestly just, I'm going to put my Alex Jones tinfoil hat on here, but... Other than Trump winning in 2016, I don't think that a single president has been legitimately elected since Woodrow Wilson or before Woodrow Wilson. I think every single election since then has been manipulated on some level and that we've had administrations installed as opposed to being elected. Donald Trump broke broke the cycle in 2016 because if you recall right up to the last minute. 99% chance that Hillary was going to win. She wasn't worried. They cheated their freaking asses off. They just didn't cheat enough to overcome the wave of Trump voters. And that's their biggest fear for 2024 this year is that there's a whole lot of pissed off Americans as far as what happened in 2020 and aren't going to stand for it. And they're going to have a harder time cheating, I believe, unless they continue to use mail-in voting where you Look at the evidence in Georgia that's been released recently. We should probably do an episode of SDN on that. The number of fraudulent votes just keeps piling up and piling up. So I won't take us down that rabbit hole since we're running out of time here. Is there anything anybody would like to add before we wrap it up and do the conflicted question? Take it away, Mike. Well, yeah, the, the only thing... I I, I just kind of need to go back to what we discussed previously and you alluded to that I think I think a lot of this with the, the massive quantities of of folks that have come in I, I invaders think, use yeah, the right word you know, I, I i think it's moot at this <laughs> point because we're in a position that this year 2024 neither side is going to be willing to accept mm -hmm. what the other side because of a complete lack of trust in the system nationwide how that's going to turn out i don't know but i don't think it's going to be good well a lack of trust is is going to tear things apart i gotta tell you mike i'm, I'm a little disappointed um, i went to great lengths to find my clown horn that my wife bought for me years ago and i didn't get to use it once in today's episode just a test run i mean ready. you, you ready to go for the next episode you could have used it when i said i was a racist uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it was sitting on my left side i'm blind on that so i couldn't see it i forgot you should have reminded me got it got it got give it. me the sign or something okay all right all right hit us with the question okay 
<clears throat> going back to our conflicted question of the day, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming out today. All right. Uh, you have been preparing for a complete collapse of modern civilization with three other families sacrificing yourselves financially to ensure the survival of your loved one. You all have about a year's worth of supplies at a secured survival retreat. You were the last ones to arrive at your location, and to your surprise, two of the families broke protocol and brought with them extra friends and family members, enough to shave off 40% of your supply timeline. Your retreat is somewhat new and renewable food sources won't be ready before the food runs out. How would you handle the situation? And and I would like to remind everybody in the in the comments section that yeah, we're going to we're going to show up in there in the comments section with you and no changing no changing the the situation. Okay? Right. The situation is what the situation is. Don't say, "Oh, right. well, I wouldn't get into that." What? Deal with the situation as it is. Jeff, we'll put you on the spot first. What I would probably do because I'm worried about the survival of my family first, but I also recognize that if it's your food, you can do what you want with it. I would say, "I want to take my 25%. I'm going to set it over here and it's going to be for me and my family. If you want to share your supplies with these people that you brought in unbeknownst to us, that's your business. I'm, I'm the libertarian. You do you. However, the fact that you broke protocol and brought in these people, and I don't care if they're your kids or your mother or whoever, that does not obligate me to endanger my family because you chose to break protocol. And or the other thing is you send them out and they got to come back with their own food. So before Jeff uh, answered that, I'm with you, Jeff. There's what I wrote down. Everybody yeah. gets their original allocation. You want to split it 10 ways instead of four ways. That's on you. Absolutely. And again, I don't be cruel about it, but my primary concern is the survival of my family. That's why we you know, went through all these steps and stockpiled these supplies. This is to me is no different than you prepare and then your neighbor down the road who didn't give a shit comes and tries to take it. Mm -hmm. The exact same situation, except maybe they don't have a gun or they're friends of somebody, but doesn't alter the fact you needed to prepare. You had an opportunity to prepare. You didn't. That doesn't give you a right to me when I prepared. I was going to say the same thing, not to uh, to echo Jeff and that, but I was going to say, take take my allotment of goods, put it off to the side for my, myself and my family. And then I don't know if you're going to throw a gotcha in there, like you said, uh, you were going to say that, no, well, everybody else is, is teaming up and say, no, we're not going to allow that. Then things have to escalate to where they have to escalate. But like Jeff said, your sole responsibility is the survival of your family and yourself. As archaic as this may sound, as a, as a male figure in a family, uh, it's your responsibility to protect your family. And that's exactly what you should be doing. So that's my perspective, at least. Right. I know there's some people out there when they watch this that would say in egalitarian uh, society, women can protect men just as, as much as men can protect women. But I guess I'm a little old fashioned. Fair enough. So Mike, uh, give us the contrarian standpoint because I know you got something to say. <laughs> no, actually, I'm I'm right there with you guys. Uh, my my idea was was exactly the same. I'm gonna I'm gonna take my 25 percent, set it aside. Now I will I will help you to acquire more supplies, mostly because I want to be able to keep an eye on everybody because I don't know these people and I want to make sure that that they are not compromising us if they find a better deal. Otherwise. Otherwise, I'm exactly in the same boat with you guys on this. I would uh, I would uh, direct them towards uh, JJ's video last week on how to build a squirrel trap out of next to nothing. I'll help you build the squirrel traps. And I'll give my recipe for squirrel and, squirrel and dumplings. Good deal. <laughs> All you, right. Know. Appreciate everybody's time and insight today. Looking forward to the next time. Everybody out there, thank you for following Survival Dispatch. This video is sponsored by William Tell Archery Supplies, home of the Mini Striker Crossbow. Click the link in the description below to learn more.